Hi, I'm Mary Steenburgen, and we're going to go through my IMDb. So settle in. Okay, do you remember your first credit? I would imagine it's the movie Going South. This was a huge thing in my life. I was from Arkansas, and then I went to New York, but then I got nowhere fast, and I was a waitress for six years, and then a casting director saw me in a show at the Manhattan Theater Club, and so I went in and had a meeting. I said, are you casting anything in particular? And she said, I am. I'm casting a movie called Going South that I'd love to get you in on, but it's really well-known actresses or very beautiful models. And I didn't fall into either of those two categories. And as I was leaving, I hear a voice saying, are you waiting to see me? And I realized it's Jack Nicholson. And Jack Nicholson at that time was a huge star. He, the biggest star, because he, he had done Cuckoo's Nest. There was nobody bigger than Jack. So I just kept my head down and I, I said, no, I'm not waiting to see you. And he goes, why not? So he walked over to the desk, picked up a script, handed it to me. He just kept me reading and reading and we read every scene in the movie like two or three times. Then he goes, I want to direct this movie. So you know what that means, don't you? And I said, yes, but I didn't have a clue what that meant. Everybody in Hollywood said, there's no way he's going to cast an unknown person as a lead in a movie when he wants to direct. And so several days later when I was serving crepes at the Magic Pan, which is where I was a waitress. I go and I check my answering machine and they say, you're going to Hollywood for a screen test for going south. A whole bunch of famous people tested, but somehow I'm the one that got it. I got that part. That's an incredible first movie story. I know. And didn't you say there was a Warren Beatty part to this story? So a couple of days after I met with Jack, I call my answering service, and then Warren Beatty comes on the phone, you know? And it's like, freaking Warren Beatty. And he said, I'm doing a movie, but my friend Jack made me sign a piece of paper saying, I won't use you for my movie unless he turns you down for his movie. And I'm like, what? I'm standing in the restaurant I work in, and I have two movie stars fighting over me and signing bits of paper. Incredible. I somehow managed not to sleep with either one of them, which in itself is some kind of record for the 70s. So do you remember what movie number two is? Yes, number two was called Time After Time. Yes. I married my co-star Malcolm McDowell, and I had two children with him. Melvin and Howard. The first time I read that script, it was sent to Jack Nicholson to play Melvin. He gave it to me as an example of great writing, but I, of course, read it and just went, well, it's also an example of a great part, and uh, I won Best Supporting Actress and Golden Globe. I mean, that's movie number three. That's insane. Yeah. So by this point, I mean, you've won the Oscar. I've done that. I feel like uh, some of your trademarks are starting to develop. High-pitched voice with a southern accent. I don't have a high-pitched voice. Not high-pitched. But I do have a southern accent, and if I'm mad or drunk, it's pronounced. That's my only trait. That's your only trait. I played the accordion. You might mention that. Romantic comedy. Dudley Moore. I mean, he was like half my height, but I did have a little crush on him. You didn't marry anyone from that movie. I didn't. Miss Firecracker. It was just this weird character. What is that movie about? I don't freaking know. What's Eating Gilbert Grape? Unforgettable. My whole part was just kissing Johnny Depp. Pontiac Moon. Pontiac Moon was a big deal to me because I did marry another actor, and that would be Ted Danson, who I still am married to all these years later. Nobody's baby. The best thing about that movie is you will never know that's Gary Oldman. It doesn't look like him, it's amazing. You know what, I don't think I knew what Gary Oldman looked like that's, until five years ago. I like a, a transformer. Elf. Sitting there looking at Will in an elf suit and trying to eat spaghetti with maple syrup and not laugh. It was just extraordinary. Step Brothers. Step Brothers is the pinnacle of my career. It's all downhill after that. John C. Riley and Will Ferrell were just insanely hilarious. You never knew what was going to happen. And people, you know how in movies, it's really boring to be on somebody else's movie set. And so people think they want to come watch a movie being filmed, but they stay five minutes when they realize how repetitive it is. With Step Brothers, people came in the morning and got their seat and stayed there all day. Guys, guys. I'll kill you, Leonard Nimoy. The clown has no penis. 
What kind of dreams are you guys having? I'm gonna give you some keywords of movies that you've been in. You see if you can guess the movie. Okay. Troublemaker, male tied up, adult actor playing a minor. Oh, that's Clifford with Marty Short. That's one of the best, worst movies of all time. Adult actor playing a teenage boy, reading a letter aloud, breakfast machine. Is this Elf? It says Back to the Future 3. What? Um, Clayton. Clarically. Four Christmases. Dwight Yoakam played my boyfriend, and I think we made out a lot, and uh, <laughs> I made out a lot as characters, of course. I thought that went unsaid, but... Okay. If you feel the need to say it... Okay. <laughs> I know, it's weird that I said it. The Open Road? The Open Road was a film, um, it's about the open, the openness of the road. <laughs> <laughs> it's not... <laughs> It's not, it's, it's okay. The one I love? I think I'm the answering machine voice, and yes. my son directed it, which is so insulting. That that's all you got? Yeah. Seven days in hell. <laughs> it was only two days in hell for me. <laughs> Curb your enthusiasm. We're playing Ted and Mary. On the show, we're now divorced, and it's really crazy how many people believed that. I had friends call me and say, I'm so, tell me it's not true. And I went, it's not true, and you're an idiot. The, the wonderful last man on earth. It still hurts to talk about it because it's, I don't know, they say it's over. I will always be slightly in mourning for it. And if anybody out there wants to like, just start it back up again. Oh, you mean like a call to Netflix or Amazon to do a few more seasons? Or at least, yeah, yeah, do that. <laughs> Book club. Well, it's a lightning in a bottle because who makes a movie with four women, the youngest of whom is 65 years old? It just made you feel good about being the age that you are and, and being lucky enough to be in this business, you know? That's the last thing on the list. I mean, how do you feel going through that? Old, but in a good way. That was me. Mary Steenburgen and my IMDb.